Brass. Bread. Blunt. Dough. Moolah. Dash. Loot. Jack. Rhino. Barbies. Spandoolies. Mopus. Death. Salt. Jink. Oof. Brass. The Reddies. Pin money, pocket money, cold heart, cash. My name is Vanessa. Valerie Pennington. Trenda Lofton. All those terms we half understand. Uh -huh. Inflation, deflation, consumer confidence. Bearish, bullish, free market enterprise. Billions, trillion. How many zeros is that again? Subprime mortgages. Subprime mortgages. Hedge funds, arbitrage, collateral, drills. Fire. I was going to do the Two thousand eight survey. Two thirds of Americans do not understand how compound interest works. Huh? Junk bonds, bottom line, Ponzi scheme, foreclosures. Oh, I wish, I wish someone had just told they me. Just, I just don't think I should have been the 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 Liquidity, commodity futures, short selling, call option, consumer sovereignty. Balance sheets hung out to dry. Oh my God. Foreclosures, depreciation, the fiscal cliff. Diversified, In January 2014, salary, Janet Yellen was budgets, confirmed as the head of the Federal Bank, Reserve Bank, the first woman in its 100-year-old history. I wouldn't worry your pretty little head off about that. Jerk! I am so not an actress. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really like performing, and um, I dance a lot, and I... Um, I've done some performance in the past, but I haven't done any acting per se. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to break out into something else, and here I am. I was actually involved with the first reading of Legal Tender like five years ago. Um, so it was like one of the first versions of the play. Um, and then I was contacted to do it by Melissa. Okay. And yeah. When I first met Rob, I used to bet on horses all the time. And then I got into football and I started betting on football. I was really good at it. And we were at the bar one night and I was betting on something. And Rob says, you know, this makes me really uncomfortable. So I didn't do it, I put the books away and I didn't gamble for many, many years. And then one winter, I went down to Florida and my cousin Keith taught me how to play poker. He took me to the casinos where his wife worked and I did great because it's all about numbers and percentages plus reading people is part of my job. So the poker table was like one big happy family and I was really good at it. Then I came home and my best friend's husband played in a poker game. And I asked if I could join. I had no idea what I was doing, but I wound up winning that first night. And I thought, oh, I could be good at this. And then I just became obsessed. And I taught myself to play and play and play. And I went to LA and played in the casinos. And I started to get better and better and winning more and more. And then somebody told me about online poker and how great is that. You can just stay home in your pajamas. <laughs> so I started doing that and I lost $300 that first night and really threw up. I thought I was going to die. I was so embarrassed and freaked out. I said, oh my God, I'll never do that again. And then I lost $300 the next day. The thing about being an addict is you believe you cannot stop. You say, okay, Tomorrow, first of the month, every addict does that. And when they stop, they say, what was I doing? What was I thinking? But my addiction was just like throwing money away. I lost more than half my house cost me, probably $75,000. I kept at it for a year and a half. And then one day, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't 
lie and hide and cheat one moment more. It took me a long time to pay back that money, but I did, and the burden was on me and nobody else. I'm so grateful I stopped when I did. I could so easily have done something really stupid, because you know, bookmakers love an addictive gambler. They love us. I never borrowed money. I never put myself in a weird place. But yeah, it was crazy. Every day was like torture. I woke up every day and was completely freaked out. And now people say, well, are you gonna do it again? And I say, nah, I'm so over it. But that doesn't mean I'm not capable of getting obsessed about something else. <laughs> but I hear from a lot of gamblers who tell me I can't stop. And I say, yes, you can and you will. One day you will. How did you get involved with Legal Tender? Well, um, I saw the awesome flyer for it. <laughs> have you seen it? I have, yeah. Okay, it has the little bra on it with mm -hmm. the money coming out of the yeah. bra. And I was like, hmm, that looks really interesting. Okay. And uh, so I saw that and I decided that I want to audition. Right. Well, I got involved um, because Melissa's my neighbor. Okay. And she had been after me for a while. She said, oh, I've heard you tell stories. Why don't you join us? And I'm like, the first time she asked was the vagina monologues. And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> but this time she kind of caught me off guard. So I said, yeah, of course, I'll do it. On average, a husband is three times more likely than a wife to take primary responsibility for managing the family's money. But as a couple, a couple sinks into financial turmoil, this tends to shift. It is wives who deal with foreclosure notices, wives who plead with creditors for more time to pay, and wives who insist on seeking credit counseling or legal help. Yeah, I think um, everyone should come see Legal Tender because it kind of brings to light things that aren't often talked about. Um, it kind of, um, I, I feel like there's something that everyone can relate to. You know, or there's, yeah, there's a little something, if not a lot of something, that people can relate to within the script. We started talking about divorce just before Passover. I went to the vault to get out my engagement ring, and it wasn't there. So I went home and I said to Howard, I can't imagine what happened, but my engagement ring's not in the vault. And he said, no, I took it. And I remember thinking, was it mine or was it his? It was just the most upsetting. I can still feel it, as if I were being somehow struck in the stomach. And I said, what do you mean you took it? And he said, well, I had it appraised. I'm probably going to sell it. I'm going to need the money. And I took the rest of the jewelry he had given me including my wedding ring, and I threw it at him, and I said, I don't want any of this. I was so upset. I was so enraged. I realized for the first time, very starkly, that it wasn't really mine. It was he had invested, something he had invested in, a symbol of the alliance. I'm not even saying marriage. The alliance was over, so he would reclaim his property. He actually said to me, you never wear it. And I said, where am I going to wear it? To Harlem, where I'm doing my research on single room occupancy hotels? To the grocery store? Well, if you don't wear it, what's the difference? It was a square cut diamond of nearly four carats. It was beautiful. He had been in that business and he knew how to get something good. I didn't care. At some level, I didn't really care. What was upsetting was that something I had thought of as mine wasn't mine. And I realized then that the house I lived in was his too. And that in a very real sense, I was a non-person. He was getting on with his life. And mine was over in his eyes. Huh. 
It was brutal, very brutal. I got quite hysterical, huh. but since I don't really care about stuff, I got over it pretty quickly. Come check it out. <laughs> and hopefully, like, I, I think it's, it's a conversation starter, you know, and so hopefully it'll be, you know, those it'll offer up opportunities for people to continue the conversation and hopefully feel a little bit less like, you know, ashamed or quiet about whatever their situation is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I think everybody should come see it that wants to know about money. <laughs>